the problem. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the September Henry School Board meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, initially, please uh, join me in saluting the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. student recognition that you're going to preside over. Thank you, Dr. Yarnell. As you know, board members at each meeting, we try to highlight students or staff members that have done wonderful things for our district and brought positive recognition 
Tonight is no exception, and tonight we have two groups of students being recognized for academic achievement. First, we have seniors Aiden Bueller, Sarah Craig, and Joshua Rush. They are National Merit Scholarship semifinalists. They have an opportunity to continue in the competition for some 7,500 National Merit Scholarships worth about $33 million that will be offered next spring. About 1.6 million juniors in more than 22,000 high schools entered the 2017 National Merit Scholarship Program, taken by the 2015 Preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. This served as an initial screen of program entrance. The nationwide pool of semifinalists representing less than 1% of U.S. high school seniors includes the highest scoring entrance in each state. To become a finalist, the semi-finalist in his or her high school must submit a detailed scholarship application in which they provide information about the semi-finalist's academic record, participation in school and community activities, demonstrated leadership abilities, employment, and honors and awards received. From the approximately 16,000 semifinalists, about 15,000 are expected to advance to the finalist level. Every finalist will compete for one of 2,500 National Merit $2,500 scholarships that will be awarded on a state representational basis. So please help me in congratulating Aiden Bueller, Sarah Craig, and Joshua Rush. Joining me and congratulating them is, as you know, our principal, Ms. Gina DeBone, and I know she too is very proud of them. Our other students to be recognized tonight are senior John Worthington and sophomore Emma Pope. Oh, excuse me. They represented Penridge this summer at the invitation only 2016 Congress of Future Science and Technology Leaders, which took place on the campus of the University of Massachusetts Lowell. John, who attended for the second year in a row, and Emma were joined by 4,000 high school students from across the country in accepting the invitation to participate. They spent three days learning from a group of well-known leaders and innovators in science, technology, and university education, including Nobel laureates, captains of industry, pure science competition winners, and I believe educators. The conference, sponsored by the National Academy of Future Scientists and Technologists, is an honors-only program for high school students who are passionate about science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, as we know STEM. The purpose of the event is to recognize, inspire, motivate, and direct the top students in the country who aspire to be scientists and technologists according to the conference's website. Invitation is by academic nomination, and students must have a minimum 3.5 grade point average. So congratulations, Joan and Emma. Thank you, Dr. Radigan. At this point, we'll move to comments from guests. I would note before we do that that the Penridge School Board welcomes public comment according to policy 903. We remind everyone of the following. Public comments shall be limited to three minutes unless otherwise specified by the board. Participants must be recognized by the presiding officer and note their name and municipality. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer rather than to individual board members district employees or members of the public, a speaker may speak once during each comment period. 
Please note that these sessions are designed for comments to protect the confidentiality and privacy rights of all members of our community and the board encourages members of the public to direct any comments regarding particular individuals such as students or district employees privately to the superintendent or other appropriate administrator or to communicate to the board privately by sending an email to board at penridge.org. Questions raised and not addressed may be followed up at a later time. Okay, um, I'm going to call Mr. and Mrs. McMorty to the podium first. Our son, John, graduated from Penridge in 2011 uh, and then graduated with his degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford University in 2015. He was a graduate student there in the School of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, this summer, um, on August 21st, he suffered heat stroke while running a half marathon and five days later he died. Um, we are here tonight to thank the board for allowing us to rent the auditorium to hold a memorial service for John on September 1st. Um, it was a service that was a great blessing to us personally and to many who love John in this community and in uh, Upper Bucks County and even um, some of his friends from Stanford who flew in. Um, it was a wonderful evening, and it was standing room only in the auditorium. So it's unlikely we would have found an appropriate venue, and we couldn't think of any better place to hold a memorial service for John, who loved the school, and uh, did this school proud, and this school did him a great service by giving him a great education throughout all his years in the Penridge District. I don't know whether it's appropriate, but I have some special thanks that I'd like to, if you will, will indulge. Uh, special thanks to Greg Benson, who suggested that we hold it here, and we rushed forward and uh, actually inappropriately announced it. Um, special thanks to Dr. DeBona and Dr. Radigan, who saw fit that our uh, boldness um, actually led us to use the facility. We really appreciated that. And that Dr. Radigan spent a lot of time working on this on the first day of school was quite amazing and a great gift. Uh, thank you, too, to Barry Casper, who went to the trouble to stop by uh, Jeff Gaiman's office and encourage him about the use of the facility, uh, even though he had a family emergency that he was attending to. Uh, special thanks, too, to Cindy Paul and David Schlotter and the guy who's the star of the evening tonight, Aidan Bueller, who uh, helped with the AV and made the service run so smoothly. And to the custodians, Paul and Connie, and the custodial staff, everybody who was there was just amazed by the beauty of the facility and the way it had been maintained and the way everyone involved with the school district who was there that night treated us. And so uh, from the bottom of our hearts, we say thank you. We miss John a great deal. You, in your kindness, uh, helped us remarkably. So thank you on behalf of our family and on behalf of John. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMorty, and please accept our condolences in addition. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. The next name is, and I apologize in advance for anyone's name who I managed to mangle because I can't read the writing. Uh, that's my problem, not yours, but I believe this first name is Erica Calenza.
Good evening. My name is Erica Salenza. Good evening. My name is Erica Salenza, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here on behalf of the parents of the former former school, CNIA at Sacred Heart. Our, it was announced in April that our school would be closing, and we were given a choice of Catholic schools outside of the district for which Penridge would bus to. Our, our children started school September 7th, and when the problems first arose when we received our schedules. Our elementary children are getting uh, the buses, or catching the buses at 6.15 in the morning for an 8.15, uh, 8.45 start. And this affects mainly modern day, the, the one school that they bus to in Lansdale, but it also affects Regina Academy. On the way home, our children get out at 3.30, and some are not getting home until 5 o'clock. When you add this one to a school day, it's an 11-hour day for elementary school children. We have gone through the proper chains of commands. We started with the transportation center. We've gone to the superintendent's office, and we're asking you to help us find a solution. Some parents have decided to carpool, and the problem with that is if your children is if they don't ride the bus for two weeks, they're dropped off the rotation. If the school has an emergency or there's a snow closure uh, in the afternoon, they won't bus our children. So we're asking you again if you could please look into the situation and if we could get a resolution. 11 hours is a long day for an elementary school child. We don't even work that long. So if you could, thank you. Thank you. This is Glenn. <laughs> uh, Kelly Smola. My name is Kelly Smola. I'm from Percy Borough, and I'm here tonight to address a concern about the transportation policy of the district. My husband, John Small, apologizes that he was unable to attend with me due to my daughter's soccer game tonight, which he's coaching. Our son, Darian, has begun third grade at Guth Elementary this fall. For the past two years, he has happily ridden bus two. However, as he is now in third grade and we live within a mile of the school, I have discovered that he is no longer allowed to ride the bus and must become a walker. We live 0.94 miles from the side entrance to Guth Elementary. We ask that the district change your transportation policy, which as we understand it, is that all elementary age children in first and second grade are bused, but once you are in third grade, you are only bused if you live outside of the mile distance from the school. A mile is too far for elementary age students to walk. There is not appropriate supervision for children over that distance. There are not crossing guards at every intersection that a student would need to cross to get to school. For example, my son would need to cross six intersections with no crossing guards, in addition to the intersections that have crossing guards. Also, children that age are still small, and for those that live out at that, those one-mile marks, it takes over half an hour for them to walk to school on the days that have nice conditions. That is not taking into consideration the pouring rain where they will be drenched by the time they reach school, or the really hot days where we are dismissing them early because of the heat, but then they are required to walk for 30 minutes in that heat home. Also, after storms, winter storms, when people do not appropriately shovel their sidewalk, the children are going to have to walk in the street around piles of snow, which is also not safe. Has the district looked into their transportation policy lately to determine if the added expense to bus elementary, all elementary students would be low enough to consider the added safeguard to our children? We are asking the district to look into these issues and recommending that the school board change the policy to bus all children in, ele in elementary school regardless of the distance unless parents opt out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next name is Chuck, and I really cannot read the last name. Chuck Walshaw. I'm sorry. Chuck Welshaw, W-E-L-C-H-O-F-F. We got that? Welshaw. The reason this is important is that it's taken as part of the meeting. Right. That's why I called it for you. Thank you. 
We're from Bedminster. I'm here to support my daughter tonight. She's the one I just spoke about by changing the bus time for the children walking a mile at that age, and we would like it changed. My wife and I are both here for the same reason. I'm Barbara Welshaw. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next two names are Craig Edwards and Eric Lucas. Sorry, I had to bring my own water. Are we separate? Can we can we each get yep. three minutes? Lead sure. off and I'll okay. follow. All right. Um, thank you. My name is Craig Edwards. I live in Bedminster. I have had four kids in uh, the district. Right now I have three, two high schoolers and an elementary school student. I'm here to talk about uh, the Title IX issue. Um, I sent uh, exactly six emails asking the board and Dr. Radigan the very same question after the Obama or the DOJ letter came out. Um, this is a very simple question. Are boys allowed in the girls' locker room and restrooms and vice versa? I have yet to receive one substantive response. Okay? The first email that I sent, I got a response from Dr. Reagan, which I appreciated. She said, the district will comply with the obligations of the new guidelines under Title IX, which is great until you read the new guidelines under Title IX, which I'll go into and which is why I have the question. And if anybody here would like to interrupt me at any moment to give me the answer to my question, I'm happy to listen. Okay? As I said, six emails. No response, substantive. The DOJ, Department of Justice letter, refers to gender identity, as you probably know because you may have read it. Your counsel, I'm sure, has. Um, gender identity refers to an individual's internal sense of gender. A person's gender identity may be different from or the same as the person's sex assigned at birth. <coughs> sex assigned at birth refers to the sex designation recorded on an infant's birth certificate. Transgender describes those individuals whose gender identity is different from the sex they were assigned at birth. A transgender male is someone who identifies as a male but was assigned the sex of female at birth, which means by this DOJ um, edict that if I'm a Penridge student and I walk into school and I decide that I'm a female today, I'm a female. So I can go into the girls' locker room, I can do whatever I want. And I don't know whether Penridge has adopted that or has that as a policy, I've asked six times and I have not received an answer from the board or Dr. Radigan, and I, I, I wouldn't be here today if somebody would just tell me what the policy is. You've got a 60 page plus policy handbook here. You've got policies related to um, drug and alcohol, food and drink, types of absences. You've got a library rules and regulation policy on page 49. Nowhere can I find out whether my 13 year old daughter who's getting ready for a volleyball game is going to have boys come into the locker room and whether that will be banned or disallowed under Penridge policy. I'd like an answer, and I think there's a lot of parents who might want an answer to that question. Okay, let me just go through a couple things on this letter. I'm going to try to squeeze it into three minutes here. I, I, I recognize the time's valuable. As a condition of receiving, this is back to the DOJ letter, as a condition of receiving federal funds, the departments treat a student's gender identity. That means what they determine they are in their own mind. That doesn't have anything to do with the anatomical makeup of a person. Gender identity is what they think they are in their own mind. So the first question I have, does that change from day to day? Could it change today, tomorrow, the next day? Could I be a different gender every day of the week? Do I have to register with Penridge? Do I have to say what I am? Do I have to have anything implicit that determines what I am? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know that you do either, but I'd like to know. Um, the treat a student's gender identity as a student's sex for purposes of Title IX and its implementation of regulations. This means that a school must not treat a transgender student differently from the way it treats other students of the same gender identity. It keeps using the word gender identity, which means not gender, not sex, gender identity, which means that person can decide for themselves on a day or hourly or weekly or monthly basis what they are, which means they can go where they want in this school. Under Title IX, there's no medical diagnosis or treatment requirement that students must meet as a prerequisite to being treated consistent with their gender identity. I'll, I'll try not to hammer that one in too hard. When a school provides sex segregated activities and facilities, transgender students must be allowed to participate in such activities and access such facilities consistent with their gender identity. As it applies to restrooms and locker rooms, I'm quoting, 
A school may provide separate facilities on the basis of sex, but must allow transgender students access to such facilities consistent with their gender identity, who they think they are. A school may not require transgender students to use facilities inconsistent with their gender identity or to use individual user facilities when the other students are not required to do so. A school may, however, make individual user options available to all students who voluntarily seek additional privacy. What that means, and I, I don't, I'm not trying to tell you what it means, but what that means to me is that the kid, the child, can choose where they want to go, but you can't tell them where they want to go. And Dr. Radigan's response to me was, she has adopted Title IX. Okay, and if that's the case, then this is policy at Penn Ridge, and if it's not, please tell me. Anybody here can tell me. I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear it. As I said, six emails, no response. Matter of fact, the last email, I sent a seven-page legal letter which documented where, where I'm at and what the law is in the United States. Now, there's some questions I have briefly. If I can decide what I'm going to be today as, as in my mind, as gender, gender identity, what does that mean related to athletics? There's a paragraph in here. I can't make sense of it, and I've got some training. And I don't know what it says, but if I decide I want to play on the girls' volleyball team, can I do that today? No? Yes? I don't know. I don't know what it means. Furthermore, page 4 of 8, same letter, and I'm quoting, Title IX allows a school to provide separate housing on the basis of sex, allows a school. But a school must allow transgender students to access housing consistent with their, with their gender identity, who they think they are, and may not require transgender students to stay in a single occupancy accommodation or to disclose personal information when not required of other students. So if we've adopted Title IX, when kids go on a field trip here, does that mean a group of 10 high school boys who are 18 years old who might be on a field trip with younger girls who are minors can stay wherever they want? Because that's what this says. And I'd like an answer to the question. I've asked six times. Nobody will respond to me. Now, I just want to briefly, and I'm, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. The last email I sent, um, I received a generic response from Dr. Radigan to my very specific questions about where can boys go. What if there's an 18 year old boy who's tutoring in an elementary school, and there's a first grade girl who goes into the bathroom? Can he follow her? What if there's five or six high school boys at an elementary school? What if there's an adult my age who walks into the school? Is he allowed in the, in the restrooms where a kindergarten or first grade girl is by this school's policy? What's the policy? Very briefly, my letter, which I sent to the board, you have this letter. It's seven pages, but I'm going to put it on record here. The first page was me outlining where I was going. Okay, the rest of the letter says, the information that follows demonstrates, one, federal law allows schools to have sex-specific restroom showers and changing areas. Two, allowing students to access facilities dedicated to the opposite sex violates the fundamental rights of the vast majority of students and parents. That would be me. Schools have broad discretions to regulate the use of school restrooms, showers, and changing areas. Here's the law, and I provided it to all of you, council as well. Okay, Title IX specifically allows schools to, quote, provide separate toilet, locker room, and shower facilities on the basis of sex. Okay, provide separate toilet, locker room, and shower facilities. That's what we're talking about. Accordingly, both federal and state courts have almost uniformly rejected arguments suggesting that Title IX requires schools to give students access to opposite sex restrooms and changing areas. Rather, these courts have found that schools do not discriminate under Title IX when they limit the use of sex-specific restrooms. Sorry, I knew I'd get dry mouth. I followed that up with a bunch of cases. Castle v. Mar Maricopa County, where Castle, who was both a student and an employee of the college, was barred from using the restroom. Okay? The case was consistent with Title IX being interpreted so that that student couldn't go into a restroom inconsistent with their gender. In March 2015, Pennsylvania Federal Court similarly, similarly that's a tough word, examined whether a university receiving federal funds engages in unlawful discrimination in violation of the United States Constitution and federal and state statutes when it prohibits a transgender male student from using sex-segregated restrooms and locker rooms designated for men on a university campus. The case is Johnson v. University of Pittsburgh. The court concluded that the simple answer is no. It held that the university's policy of requiring students to use sex-segregated bathroom and locker room facilities based on students' natal and birth sex, that's not what's in your head, rather than their gender identity, does not violate Title IX's prohibition of sex discrimination. 
Likewise, RMA versus Blue Springs, the Missouri court, same thing. I could go into detail, but I won't. It references gender identity, which is referenced in Title IX. You should also note this DOJ letter, which I hope counsel researched, did not follow the Administrative Procedures Act. You have to go through rules. You have to go through a procedure to issue a letter like this. It did not follow the rules. It's not a, this is not policy. This is not the government's policy. This letter that the DOJ issued was merely them trying to influence schools like ours. And what happened at Penridge? You jumped. You flinched and you went, whoa, whoa, what are we going to do? You didn't wait till the law was settled. You didn't wait. You didn't, you didn't pause and say, wait, let's do some legal research. It took me a couple hours to come up with this. Okay, this, isn't, this is not difficult stuff here. Seven pages of it. Doe versus Clark. Title IX does not require letting students use the restroom that corresponds with their gender identity. Okay, I mean, these are, these are recent cases as well. Um, federal regulations make clear that significant guidance documents issued by executive agencies are not binding in nature and should not be improperly treated as legally binding requirements. That's what I was referencing a moment ago. Okay, I just, like I said, if you guys would answer me, I wouldn't have to do this. But I want, I want to be on the record with the law here. Um, can I have your deference for two minutes? May I? Yes, please go ahead, but please finish. Okay, I'm, I'm talking as fast as I can. I really am. <clears throat> um, I, I'm going to skip a couple cases, but there's about seven, eight cases in here that state the exact same thing that I've already mentioned. Secondly, second issue, tort law. I'll basically sum this up. As a district, you are asking for trouble when you allow men into a girl's locker room or bathroom at this school at any level, you're asking to get sued. Because when it happens, when something goes wrong in there, there's going to be a problem with parents like myself who are going to say, the school was complicit, the school fostered an environment that was harassment. And if you read your policies, and I, won't, I don't have time to go through it, but your policies are very clear about sexual harassment and other harassment. And by allowing students to share restrooms with people of the opposite sex atomically, not gender identity. You're asking for tort actions. And it's already happened. I sent Dr. Radigan links to some cases that have already happened in the last couple months since this law has been attempted to be implemented in various states. Also, you're going to run into religious liberties arguments. Students of parents who are compelled to go here. Penridge is an educational monopoly. Okay, you take my money. My kids are compelled to come here. If I want to go someplace else, I have to pay two times. Okay? So it's not like I can take my money and go wherever I want. I don't have a choice. I have to come to Penridge or I get punished because I have to pay twice. You're forcing my children to come here. So while they're here, they're under your care and control. And if you're going to allow 18-year-old men to walk into their restroom or locker room or changing room, you're, you're asking for litigation. And that's going to cost the taxpayers money when it happens. Okay, I'm just going to conclude like this. Loss of federal funding is an extremely remote possibility for at least two reasons. First, Title IX does not require a school to open its restrooms to students of the opposite sex. So, as a majority of federal and state courts have held, the Department of Education's basis for threatening schools with loss of funding is absolutely meritless. Counsel can read my letter. I state case after case after case as to why that's true. It's already been through the court system. This question's already been there. The DOJ letter is completely superfluous to the existing law. Secondly, schools continue receiving their federal funding even if they take a principled stance. You have 30 days to appeal it. Even if you took a stance and said nothing's changing, you don't lose your federal funding because I know that's a big fear here. So I appreciate your time. I wish I could go through everything that I've researched for this. I put it in an email. You all have it. I'm very happy with the school district. I appreciate Dr. Radigan. I appreciate the principal of Penridge. I've been very happy with Penridge. The board has been fantastic. This is in no way a reflection of my general perception of Penridge. I appreciate this district. I like being here. But this question has got to be answered. You've got policies on every other issue. Dr. Radigan, please answer my question. Are the boys allowed in the girls' locker room? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards, and I will ask counsel to uh, respond at the end of the session. So if you stick around, okay. you'll hear what he has to say. Mr. Lucas? Thank you for your time. My name is Eric Lucas. I'm here to support the same research that Mr. Edwards Esquire has presented to you today. I'd like to thank you for your time. I've been homeschooling my children 
uh, for 19 years. Just this year, I put my three youngest children in a goof because I trust you. I trust your ability to protect our children, to protect our daughters, and to protect our sons. Just to boil it down into simple terms, I think I speak for all Penridge parents when I say, I frankly don't care if a Penridge male wakes up one day and self-identifies as a seventh grade girl, or as a golden retriever, or as a Volkswagen Beetle. Even if he sleeps in his parents' garage, it doesn't make him a car. None less than if he wore pigtails and a skirt, does it make him a girl. It would greatly concern me if Penn Ridge would allow a male into a locker room with my daughter. And I believe that you would believe the same of your daughter. Because you don't know the true mind of anyone who self-identifies one day or the next as to what their true intent is. And quite frankly, it's startling that we would even have to discuss this in our country. When I look at my dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. I don't know if that's still true anymore, but I sure hope it is. Because on every foundation of faith that I know of, we know basic right and wrong. We know common sense. We know to protect our daughters against any possible harm. I provided Dr. Radigan with some information that I got from my friend Diane Gramley. She's the president of the American Family Association of Pennsylvania. The American Family Association of Pennsylvania is working with legal counsel across the country to provide language that any school district can use in their policies to be able to protect your ability to exclude people of one gender from the locker room of another. Just as Mr. Edwards had said, there's already been many legal cases, and I don't want to see our school district sued for invasion of privacy, which is also law that Mr. Edwards has provided to Dr. Radigan that I've seen regarding a legal statute in Pennsylvania on evasion of privacy, which is brought to court solely on vision. If a female sees a male invading her privacy, she has legal recourse to sue. That's black and white. I think we can all understand what invasion of privacy means. I don't want to see our tax money spent on lawsuits that don't need to happen if we just use common sense. I hope that we work with the American Family Association and legal counsel across the country to protect our children and to use the common sense that we're given by God to protect each other, to protect our livelihood, to protect our children who we hold most dear. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next individual is Maggie Johnson. Good evening. My name is Maggie Johnson, and I live in Hilltown Township. And I am here on behalf of some parents of students at St. Jude School. Um, we also choose to send our kids to Catholic school, and we are having some busing issues. Not necessarily the long time spent on the bus, but every day my kids ride on five different buses. They get picked up on one bus, they get dropped off where they go on a waiting bus, where they wait for 20 minutes. Then two more buses come, and they can get on either bus. There's no assignment, so at, on any given day, I'm not sure which bus my children are on or whether they're all together on the same bus. And then they get taken to school from there where they arrive with maybe one or two minutes until the bell rings. In the afternoon, they get on a bus that is driven out to Montgomeryville to uh, MMR school where sometimes no kids get on the bus. So they've driven out there for no reason. Then they get back and they wait again
Hi, good evening. My name is Jen Dabweiler. I am the parent of an 11-year-old student at North Middle School. I live across the street on the same development. These are also other parents that are here with the same kind of concerns. Our children were taught at the beginning of the year, stay in the crosswalk, wait for the go sign, get off your phones, pay attention, and thankfully, we taught our kids well because the first two days of school, all, the three of our kids were almost hit by a school bus on day one and by a parent on day two. Day three, there was two police officers there. Everything went very well. Day four, our kids were halfway across the street and the buses decided they wanted to beat the kids. So the kids were forced to run back to the curb and wait till the buses left. This is unacceptable and it is unsafe. As a community, we should be protecting our students. Our children should not have to fear coming home from school. Um, I've noticed as of late, I leave at 6.30 in the morning, we have police officers out there. Thankfully, they are coming down, but they are not staying through the middle school dismissals, and that's where our youngest students are. 11 years old is still a little kid. They're still distractible. They have six to eight seconds to cross the road on the walk sign. That is not enough. On top of that, we are relying on parents and buses to abide by the pedestrian crosswalk. So the school issue is everybody leaving the complex. It's not the cars on Fifth Street that are causing the damage. It is the cars leaving the high school property. They're coming out and making lefts, and we're expecting the buses and the parents driving to abide by the kids in the crosswalk having the right of way. And this is not happening. The <coughs> only way that this is going to be eliminated is if we have a crossing guard or a four-way red. The timing was supposed to be adjusted. As of today, it was up to maybe eight seconds. Um, so I'm here to ask what you will do in order to help us move forward in a crossing guard. This is not the first year it's been an issue. It's been an ongoing issue. And this year, hopefully with your help and East Rockville Township, we can find a compromise so that I won't have to sit and worry that my child got hit on the side of the road because a parent was late to get their daughter to dance class or the buses wanted to be on time for their runs out of the school not paying attention to my tiny little 11 year old walking across the street and following all the rules. So I asked you school board, what are you gonna to do to help us parents make sure our kids get home from school safely? Thank you. Thank you. Amy Sivazo? Sorry. Bad handwriting. <laughs> I'm Amy Scabuzzo. I'm from the same neighborhood. I don't have much to add to what uh, Jen said other than I have been standing there since day three, every morning, every afternoon, and I have watched firsthand. So I, I've been the main eyewitness. There's been other parents there some days, and in the morning some days. Uh, it's not safe. And I do see that there have been signs put on Fifth Street and I know that the timing has supposedly been adjusted. I keep counting it, I'm still getting seven seconds. I do have a letter from another parent who on Friday, after the signs had been put there, after the lights had been changed, <coughs> Friday morning she was dropping her kids at North, saw two girls almost get hit in the intersection. Signs aren't working, the timing is not working, if that is what has been done. Um, we need a crossing guard. And I know that uh, the other intersection is Perkesy, we're East Rock Hill, so I know East Rock Hill, we need to get them on board, we need your help. I mean, that's just the bottom line, and like I said, I have a letter, I don't know if you would like it, if you'd like a copy of mine. We did deliver six or seven letters at least to Mr. Daubert's office that I think went on to East Rock Hill. But we just, I know it's, I mean, I know in 2010, our neighbor's son got hit in that intersection. This is ongoing, but we need to fix it. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Elizabeth Gerard. Hi, I'm here with the same group. I'm here as a taxpayer in Perkinson, <coughs> also a former uh, teacher and a proud grandparent of two Penridge students. I think Penridge is a phenomenal school district, but it is a dangerous situation. I have been there mornings and afternoons and seeing, unfortunately, too many kids almost get hit and have to run back to the, uh, the sidewalk. Um, as Amy mentioned, there was a child hit here, here years ago. I know I don't have to remind you, you all are aware of that. No price can be put on a child 
please see that they get a crossing guard. It's really important. Thank you. Allie Tomeo. And again, I'm with the same group. Um, in addition, um, there was also that morning where there was the bus accident. And um, there are several mornings that I have a neighbor helping get my middle school child off to, uh, you know, for the morning. But I'm always there in the afternoon. Um, I live at the end of the development that's actually closer to the middle school. Um, and I work overnight hours. So the morning of that bus accident, even though I was fairly confident both my children were already in school, as the fire truck zoomed past me and I could see the fire, the police lights in the distance ahead of me, my heart sank because I didn't know if there was a child under that bus. As I got to, you know, closer and was able to see what happened, I didn't know if there was a child under the bus. I didn't know if there was a pedestrian struck or a, a car was involved. I had no idea. All I knew was, please God, let my kids really seriously have gotten where I was fairly confident that they were safely. But, you know, I can never be sure. And we do need a guard. We also could benefit from a crosswalk at the other end of the development. That is the end that my children choose, and I support them in their choice. They cross closer in the middle school because even though there's no crosswalk there, it happens to be the safer spot to, clo to cross. There aren't cars or buses or any other traffic flying out of that of the, the driveway for the school trying to make the light the cars that are at that other you know where that other corner is they're already in that 15 mile per hour mindset they're you know abiding by the law and they're they're you know my kids are safe for crossing at that end but again there should be at least at the very least a crosswalk there um, the whole situation really seriously does need a lot of help. It needs to get rectified before another person gets hurt. Thank you. Thank you. Don Orlando. Hi, my name is Don Orlando. Um, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Um, I live across from the high school and the middle school. I have a ninth grader in Ridge High School. I have two in elementary that will eventually be in the middle school and high school as well. Um, because we're so close, we have to walk um, to the middle school and to the high school. We don't have bus transportation provided. And um, we, our, our children are forced to walk across Fifth Street. And uh, kind of to reiterate what, what they both said, um, I have concern for the safety of my children and all the children in our neighborhood. Um, there's no crossing guard provided. Fifth Street can get very busy. Um, in addition, the light is not timed well. I have witnessed with my children walking across the street um, where the, the children are following the instruction of the pedestrian light and the buses are pulling out at the same time. Um, I have walked across the street with my, with my son and it has happened. So I know that it's not always the children racing across the street. It's, it's the conflict of the lights as well, um, which is a very dangerous situation. Um, I understand that there is a crossing guard over by the Giant, or Blooming Glen and, and Fifth Street. And when I had called to find out you know, why there's one there, but we don't have one, I was told, because that is considered Purposey Borough, and Purposey Borough will fund for that, but East Rock Hill Township will not fund for a crossing guard. Um, and it just concerns me. It concerns me for their safety. Um, I'm hoping we can find it in our budget um, to provide a crossing guard for our children to keep them safe. Um, and if it's East Rock Hill Township that we have to um, bring this up with, we, we just hope that we'll have your support for that. Thank you. Thank you. Juanita Weaver. I also live across the street, and I've lived there for 25 years, and I am Penridge proud. Um, I had two children that graduated from here. One of my concerns, I, I hear the concerns of the people with the crossing guard, 
I know it's difficult to cooperate budgets between the township and the school board. I live on the upper end of Campus Drive and I cannot get out of my driveway. The, I think the reason that we're, why is the traffic going through our development because of that light? And I think that if we can somehow, I mean, I'm going to go to the township, our the borough meetings as well, but somehow cooperating that we can, I, I mean, there are buses and cars that block that intersection, so I can't even get out of my driveway when that, during that time. And I keep asking myself, why are they coming through that development? Because they can't get through that intersection correctly. And they're not coming through there slowly either. And so I'm always concerned about other people, but I inch my way out of my driveway every morning. And that light certainly provided so I could get out onto Fifth Street after living there for many years. So I just think that if we can cooperate between the school board and the, the borough somehow um, to even get the timing on that light change. I think that light was a solution to a problem, but it created another problem. And so I, I think that you're hearing all of our concerns and hopefully we can all um, work together to solve this. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Irwin. <coughs> Good evening. Steve Irwin from Bedminster Township. Just here to also express my concern with the busing situation. Uh, ours is a little bit different. Um, the uh, bus stop currently is at uh, Stony Ridge Road and Twin Oaks, and I've communicated with the uh, transportation department as well as the bus driver and also with the transportation department via emails of safety concerns there uh, to which their response was it was safe and all the buses use it for all levels of elementary middle school and high school which wasn't factually true um, and then within a couple of days of their response uh, one of the students that used the high school bus almost got hit by a car at that intersection so I just asked that the response from the transportation department has been lackluster um, they haven't really evaluated my concerns. There's no safe way to walk there. Uh, the previous three years where I did not have a high school student, the bus stopped there under our street. This year it's different. Now they have to walk down to the next intersection, which again, there's no, there's no sidewalks that are required to be cleared in the winter time, so there's no way to walk down there. There's no safe place to park if you were to drive from there. There's no light, there's no crosswalk. And at the end of the development, all those items are addressed. A, they don't have to cross the main road, which is Twin Oaks. Um, there's a light there to illuminate the intersection as we head into the winter months. And they don't, it's just a much better stop. And again, I just ask that you ask the Transportation Department to address the concerns. Uh, we're three weeks into the school year now, and we haven't made any progress at all. And again, when the kids' safety is at risk, uh, I think we're moving too slow. There's enough resources and opportunities to make this better. That is asked that you ask them to make some movement and at least provide us with what the plan is. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Radigan, you wish to comment? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Yernell. First of all, thank you all for being here tonight. I know it's um, obvious that you care about your students, your children. And that's our job to care about them as well. Everything that you shared tonight, all of the speakers really kind of had a theme of safety and well-being of students. So I just want to assure all of you, we heard what you said. And in, actually, in every case, we are on it. It may not be happening as quickly as you like. But what we try to do whenever an issue is brought to us on any student or students, we take it very seriously. So, for example, on the issue about the restrooms, that came to us because of the needs of a parent regarding a transgender student. So we always try to make reasonable accommodations, and what we learned was the high school was actually the only building in the district that didn't have a single-use restroom. So what we are doing now is we are adding that so that any student can use it who desires more privacy. As far as the issue of the busing, I had my parents' superintendent meeting last week. I saw a few familiar faces that were at that meeting. We heard you loud and clear. I actually had a meeting with Mr. Daubert, Mr. Geiger, Ms. Short, and Mrs. Leatherman, our dispatcher. And I think this year is more challenging than most because of the fact that you did mention that um, some of the private schools have closed. I'm not making excuses, but it has made their job more complicated trying to get your students to their schools in a timely fashion. 
And we are also aware of the situation across the street, moving out of the high school with the intersection. Mr. Daubert has met with the township, the police department, Ms. DeBona, Dr. Cole, and they are aware of the situation. You're right, they have made some accommodations with signs and timing, but I'm hearing now that maybe that is not working as well, so I know they're going to be meeting again. So I just wanted to say that we hear you, and we are addressing this, and don't ever hesitate to call me if you have any concerns, and we will be on it as quickly as possible. Thank you. And Mrs. Schmidt, I understand you'd like to make a comment. I would. Thank you, Dr. Yarnell. Um, I would like to uh, actually comment in regard to Mr. Edwards and Mr. Lucas's comments that they made this evening regarding the uh, gender neutral bathrooms and locker rooms. I know that um, this is a difficult topic for all of us. Um, I am speaking for myself here right now. I'm not speaking on behalf of any other members of the board. Um, I sit up here representing the public. I sit up here and I represent all the students of this district. I'm concerned for the safety of all students of this district. That being said, and again, I'm speaking for myself, the comments that Mr. Edwards and Mr. Lucas made this evening, I find offensive to our male students that every example given here in regard to this topic implies that our male students are the concern here and that they're inclined to touch or act inappropriate to the females, students that are in their schools, or making assumptions that there's going to be an act committed against the female students by the male students here. This is not just about boys walking into girls' locker rooms. It is also about girls walking into boys' locker rooms. And again, I'm speaking for myself, not only as a school board member sitting here, but as a parent of a male student in the Penridge School District and I'd like to say that I am offended by the comments of both gentlemen this evening towards our male students. This can happen to any student. We don't want to see that happen to any of them. And our concern is for male and female students alike, I would assume. Mine is for male and female students alike. And again, I'm sorry to say, but I'm offended by your comments on behalf of the male students of Cambridge. Uh, Dr. Yarnell, if I may. Yes. I support Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you very much for saying that because I, I have been offended two nights now on this subject.